Chapter 5 Audiobook The World of the American Pit Bull By Richard F. Stratton Experiences written by me, and some by other authors as well, that appeared in the last two years in the Sporting Dog Journal or the American Pit Bull Terrier Gazette, formerly called the American Pit Bull Gazette, and still called out of habit have been included in this chapter. In this collage of articles the impression of events over the last few years and the concern of creators in general can be seen. I've tried to include a variety of scenarios under the different aspects of the race, but I hate the overuse of others' writings, even though there are many quality articles I would be happy to include. I thought I'd include a few articles with opinions that would be at odds with mine, but I felt that doing so might be confusing for new creators, so most of what appears here is writing that's in line with what I think. But, to be honest, my positions are much more considerable in the habit of speaking of the general opinion of pit bull breeders. The reader will note that my dedication to this book includes, to the memory of Harvey Greenwood. I have good reason for including this dedication. First of all, the Greenwoods are good friends and good people. Their children, almost all grown up by now, are charming, forgiving, and thoughtful, everything you would want your offspring to be. All of this was not an accident, as Ralph and Renee are good, responsible parents, and they are family-based. This made Harvey's tragic death that much harder to accept. I originally planned to write a section about Harvey myself for this book as an explanation of the dedication, but I believe it could not be half as eloquent as the following article written by the Greenwoods themselves shortly after Harvey's death. He was a dog lover. All your life. Harvey Eugene Greenwood. Born March 4, 1961, died October 25, 1981. The Greenwood Family Pit Bull Gazette, November 1981 Harvey loved life and lived it to the fullest. He loved children and his patience with them brought out the best in them. Several times the neighboring children would look for him to come out and play with them, even though he was a man. He loved a dog, any dog, and they played an important part in both his life and his death. Many times we would wake him up to go to school or work and find that he had gone to the kennel and brought some stray that was whining for love and attention. I'll never forget the night her chosen bed partner was an attack-trained CIA Doberman named Saber. As soon as I struck dawn that morning, Saber responded like a trained dog and only a hasty slam of the door between us and a command down with Saber calmed my nervous stomach. Harvey was excellent when dealing with any dog in or out of the ring. Whatever the dog's constitution, he treated it with love and compassion at the grooming place or in the kennel, demonstrating a dog, or in a drastic situation, with a cool head and a steady hand. He made it look easy. But it was Pit Bulldog that was special to him. He cleaned up a lot of dog messes like Jimmy Boots, Clem, C.H. Cobra, Doty Patch, Oki, Davis, and Black Sabbath, the latter two belonging to Maloney who proved to be be a problem for him in a Utah showing. He marched many miles, running alongside them, his physical strength matching the dogs. When the accident occurred, it was an injured dog that became the focus of Harvey's attention. He was taking care of a dog that had been injured that night. When he awoke in the early hours of the morning to see the dog again, a strong fire spewed violently from the bathroom and blocked the way to the door. He forced his way through and kicked the door open, but an afterthought about the dog made him hesitate more than he'd realized and the toxic smoke was too much for him. He managed to throw the dog out the door, but it landed a few feet away. And so it was that both in his death and in his life, 
dogs played an important part in his life. His life was short but full. He was loved and in return he loved. When thoughts of him wander to the dogs you love, remember Harvey and his smiling face. We will always love you, Harvey. Our hearts are broken. A Loaded Gun Richard Stratton Pitbull Gazette, February 1980 A total buzz was caused in my town when a local veterinarian advised a customer that when he purchased his pit bull puppy, he had in effect purchased a loaded gun that could go off at any time, probably when he least expected it. Well, a mix of bull terrier, staff, Stafford, and pit bull devotees were all now ready to lynch the good doctor and run him out of town. Everyone was angry because they thought the vet was saying the pit bull was a wayward and unreliable dog. Since I knew the vet personally, I was pretty sure he meant no such thing, and I was right. All he was doing was warning his client to be careful with his dog around other dogs. I haven't discussed such a warning because I've always been stressed about the same thing. As a dog lover, it pains me deeply to see a pit bull go into battle with a stray, for example, not a pit bull. The mutt may start out full of confidence, but he soon becomes a beaten and terrified animal. No one can make a legitimate claim about the pit bull's congenital propensity to fight as long as its owners are responsible people and keep the dog confined or on a chain. As I've said before several times, this is the law for all dogs anyway. Our veterinarian was aware that many pit bulls will get along with other dogs, but he didn't want his client to be misled into letting his dog run free. The problem is that the urge to fight comes on in different pit bulls at different ages and when it does come, it can come on so suddenly and without warning. However, the pit bull with people has the most dependent and stable disposition of all dogs. In fact, I don't know of any other breed that can be severely injured, hit by a car, for example, and still be handled without fear of being bitten by it. It would be unrealistic, however, to say that no pit bull is a danger to any human. First, some of our dogs are attack trained by people who want to use them as guard dogs. Second, as with all races, there will be some who are misbehaving and therefore not trustworthy with humans. In such cases, let there be no mistakes, a pit bull is quite capable of fatally wounding a large, Burly man. A good maxim to keep in mind is this, a pit bull is less likely to attack a human than probably any other dog, but if he does attack he is infinitely more dangerous. So let's not be disillusioned by serious newspaper reports of pit bulls attacking people. I checked many of these reports, and it usually turned out that it was not a pit bull at all. But none of them fooled us that such attacks never took place. Like Dr. Leon Whitney once pointed out, dogs of nearly every breed have been involved in attacks on people, many of them fatal, especially when the dogs are in packs. I well remember that a few years ago, three small Pekingese killed a baby. For some reason, even though the pit bull is not on the list of breeds that have bitten people the most, when a pit bull attack happens, the news is on the front page of the news, and the attitude is always, it seems, that the breed is created to be bad. In the wake of such publicity in Florida, some stunned lawmakers are currently proposing to ban procreation. There is an underlined lesson for us here. Never tolerate a pit bull that doesn't like humans. And this is not typical of the breed. Unfortunately, some of my good friends seem to consider their own pit bulls who don't like humans to be protectors. I'm thinking of one colleague in particular, who just became a halfback for one of the best teams in the National Football League. I did everything but punch him in the nose, 
but I'm not that stupid, to make him understand. Pit bulls are not Doberman pinchers. They're too formidable to let them stay like that. So, my friends, whatever it hurts, let's put you to sleep. They may be rare, but it only takes one attack from one to generate unbelievable publicity and, in effect, deliver a loaded gun to enemies of the race. Teaching a Pit Breed Dog Richard F. Stratton Sporting Dog Journal, January-February 1981 Oddly enough, the humanists, with their fanciful stories about training pit dogs using kittens, and small dogs as lures to taste the blood, probably caused more about cruelty than any other type of propaganda produced. There are more people on the periphery in the pit dog fraternity who apparently take this nonsense to heart and react accordingly. The stories thus become self-sufficient, at least to some extent. Recognizing that there are some newbies who subscribe to this journal, I would like, as a dog and cat lover, to describe the proper training of a young pit dog. To begin with, it must be understood that young pit bulls reach maturity in many ways and at different stages. Some are furious and will fight other pups at just a few weeks old. Others only when they are a few months old will even go up to older dogs. Dogs with a more normal threshold will not show any rush to fight until around one year of age. There were other dogs that didn't start until they were three or four or even five years old. As hard as it is to believe, courage seems to have little to do with how early a young dog gets the ball rolling. Some of the greatest dogs of all time started late. But there is no doubt that many of the good ones started at a very young age. Some breeders like to settle young dogs and not do anything with them until they are at least two years old. Others allow them to start at a younger age but don't give them any hard work until they reach maturity. Most of the best breeders I've known, Wallace, Leitner, and others, used a similar method to start young dogs. It's like that. When young dogs are at an age when they may be ready to start, an older dog is selected, usually a considerable fighter but not so talented that he will frighten a young dog and possibly stop him. The dog is walked alongside the young dogs daily. Some of them will flare up and want to fight right away. Others will try to play or just act like puppies. Whatever the reaction, the older dog is not allowed to make contact with the younger dogs. This routine can take days, even weeks, and all young dogs will be kept like this until they are itching to fight. Finally, one of the more aggressively acting young dogs will be allowed a contact and given short fights, three to five minutes, right there on the spot. If the suitor performs well and seems to enjoy it, he gets a chance for a short sparring match, possibly after a couple of fights in chains. These fights should be spaced at least a month apart to allow enough time for wounds to heal. The fight in the ring should again be short, and the young dog should probably be scratched a couple of times, very close. So a good way to cheat is to get the other dog out and then let the young dog loose so that he can search the other dog on the spot, all the while being praised for a great job done. This total series of fights can be called the trust structuring stage. Gradually the fights are extended, and a variety of opponents with various fighting styles are used. This is the learning phase of training young dogs. It is during this time that he gets an opportunity to develop a style that best suits him. After this phase, the next step is testing the games, or an inferior competition, but then, that's another story. In conclusion, some breeders will laugh at such a painstaking training program, feeling that either the dog has the sense to fight or not. Others may want to avoid excessive fighting, 
feeling that each fight takes its toll in various ways. However, short fights give the dog more than they take away. And those who protect this system feel that every little extra tissue scar that may be incurred is well compensated for by the tips and experience that the young dog will learn. The American Pit Bull bred to fight as a family guard and defense dog. Max Coates. Pit Bull Gazette, May 1981. The American Pit Bull bred for fighting is by far the largest family guard and defense dog available. We base this statement after trying German Shepherds imported from Germany, Dobermans, Rottweilers and Mastiffs from famous American breeders, Neapolitan Mastiffs from Italy, American Staffordshire Terriers from the American Kennel Club Champions and American Pit Bull from the United Kennel Club Collection. While all of these breeds have many qualities none have as many of these as the American Pit Bull Terrier bred to fight. The type of dog we are looking for must have the following qualities. First he has to have the intelligence to learn and do obedience work, second, he has to have a high pain tolerance to withstand rough play by young children, third he must be physically sound without any concern of dysplasia or other weakened defects, fourth he has to be courageous as this will allow him to react with courage and without fear to the full attack of an aggressive armed man, without giving up, whatever mistreatment he may suffer. While all the breeds I mentioned earlier exhibit some of these qualities only the APBT breed bred for fighting will exhibit all of them. This brings us to a difficult problem. How do you get a fight APBT race? The only way to be sure of getting such an animal is to buy it from a breeder that has these types of dogs. These types of dogs are of course fighting or fighting dogs. To preserve the APBT fighting dog one should combine or at least register these dogs and then breed those that show the best courage. This is a problem, as dog fighting is a violation of state, local, and federal laws when it comes to the interstate. Let's see what these fighting dog breeders are producing. First of all they are producing the toughest fighting dog in the canine world the APBT. Let's look at this point more closely. After visiting as many as 50 kennels owned by Rottweiler, Doberman, German Shepherd, Akita and Mastiff breeders, I have heard them all bragging about some incident where one of their dogs hit another dog or talking about their dog's fighting ability. One of the world's greatest Rottweiler breeders lives near me in Chesapeake, Virginia and boasts that her dogs are the toughest biting dogs in the world and that no dog can resist her big, bad Rottweilers. In the Akita kennel I visited, the woman who owned it boasted about the fighting ability of her Akitas and how they were used in Japan for this purpose. She then went on to say that anyone who owned one would have the meanest dog around. Dog World magazine even wrote an article about an Akita that beat up a pit bull, must have been an American Staffordshire. These same people who brag about how tough their dogs are with other dogs, cringe when an APBT dogfight is mentioned. Well, what I'm saying, no matter what kind of dog you own, especially those who own guard or working dog breeds, they all want the toughest dog around whether he admits it or not. If my dog were to get into a fight I by God wouldn't want him to lose or get beaten up, so why not own a dog who if he gets into a fight will not only win but will certainly be less seriously hurt. The APBT's fighting breed is this type of dog. These fighting APBT breed dogs can be encouraged to tolerate and avoid fighting with other dogs. A good example of a fighting breed dog that is good with other dogs is my newest dog, C.H. Peturbuilt. For those of you who don't know him let me explain that he is a champion fighter and a five-time winner. Well, 
Guess who's old Perturbuolt's best mate? None other than our four-year-old attack-trained German Shepherd, Cornbread. These two dogs did not grow up together as we just acquired Perturbuolt. This goes so far as to undermine the APBT's theory that the fighting breeds are crazy killers and will annihilate other dogs after they taste blood. In addition to producing the bravest fighting dog, let's see what else we can get when we create a fighting dog. First, we will have an intelligent dog that listens to its owner's voice and is responsive to it. This is important when fighting, as a good fighting dog should be responsive to its owner's voice of encouragement when in combat. Just think about it for a moment. If a dog in the middle of combat is responsive to his owner's voice, just think how responsive he will be to his owner's voice in simple obedience tasks. This responsiveness will allow you to train it more quickly and efficiently for any task. Second, the fighting dog has the highest pain tolerance of any animal in the world. When fighting they can withstand tremendous amounts of pain without so much as a whimper. It is this quality that makes him the dog best dog in the world for small children. While the pulling of the ears or a poke in the eye given by a child will cause great pain to another breed that is not predisposed to pain, an APBT fighting dog will take it lightly simply because it doesn't hurt that much. Third, a fighting dog is physically healthy. If he had poor bone formation, hip dysplasia or weakness in muscle tissue, he certainly would not have been used for fighting and thus would not have been included in any breeding program. When purchasing this type of dog you can be assured of getting a physically healthy dog. The same cannot be said for the other activity breeds, as hip dysplasia and other physical problems have excessive problems. The last and most important aspect of the breed is courage. Courage is the willingness to endure punishment and never give up the fight. Any fighting dog breeder will breed their best fighting dogs. Because if a dog abandons a fight, even if he is winning, he will be declared the loser and in this way you have lost the fight. Now one can see the importance of breeding hunting dogs to fight dogs. Courage is also a highly desirable trait for a guard and defense dog. While any of the aforementioned breeds can stop close to 90% of aggressive intruders, what about the other 10% of these attackers? They include people who aren't afraid of dogs and feel confident enough in their own physical abilities to beat up an aggressive dog. There is a need for a dog that will not give up no matter how badly he is hurt. When we look at the desirable qualities we want in a guard and defense dog they all point towards the fighting APBT breed. There are several versions of this dog. There is the AKC Staffordshire Terrier, which was the same breed but through selective breeding solely for conformation, they almost eliminated the qualities desired in a fighting dog and thus those necessary for the first class family guard and defense dog. Then we have another breed known as the UKC American Pit Bull Terrier Pet and Show Type. He was bred with American Staffordshire Terrier blood and or not bred to or from the fight bloodline for several generations. It is also being bred for conformation and in some cases for Schutzhund work. While this is fine, it will still not truly test the dog's physical condition, pain tolerance, or courage. While this is probably a better choice than the AKC Staffordshire Terrier, it is still far less desirable than the fighting American Pit Bull Terrier breed. While many people are criticizing the breeders of the fighting APBT breed and the dogs themselves, I would like to congratulate them for producing the most magnificent dog in the world. As it is now, its life may be shortened or its quality diminished by humanists who would rather destroy it than take time to learn more about them and their many productive uses.
Japanese Tosa Dogs Sword Dancer Pitbull Gazette, May 1981 The interest of APBT breeders in the Tosa is because he is an intelligent, powerful, and relatively courageous dog. It is a species of the Mastiff breed, which is a descendant of the Molossos. He was a great warrior dog and known to the Egyptians. It is designed in the sculptures on its walls called friezes. For this reason, so are the fast dogs of the greyhound type. And there are Assyrian friezes which tend to support Richard Stratton's belief that the Japanese Tosa has long been a distinct breed. Although Tosas are adaptable and serve as watchdogs and companions, they are most famously known for being primarily native Japanese fighting dogs, who prefer the word Nipponese. The weight range of the Tosas is from 45 kilos for the little one up to almost double. They resemble the first bull mastiffs that were developed in England, but they are much less pouty. Tosas are valuable and they get better bed and board and medical care than most pit bulls. Their diet consists mostly of sea proteins, cooked with cereals and seaweed. Sea protein includes fish, squid, and clam chowder broth. This was the fifth part of the audiobook. The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier By Richard F. Stratton my name is Rodolfo Luis, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went.